This is WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. You are listening to One Human Nation with your host, Sandy Batiste. This program will be talking about race and race relations in your community and nationally. Our goal is to be open, honest, and productive. Just let me adjust the sound here a little bit. Welcome to the One Human Nation Show. I'm your host, Sandy Batiste. So we're doing a little adjustment here to switch out from the awesome show that I just heard from Indigenous Voices. And thanks for Pat Gunn participating in that and sharing the, the Geechee Gully knowledge because she is the expert in, in that field. And I always learn so much when I... Um, interact with her. So as we prepare for today's show, there are a couple of clips that I want to make sure that I um, have available for us to listen to and um, engage with as we consider and continue on this reconciliation journey. And one of the things that's going on in Austin right now is the city of Austin's budget process. So before I talk to you more about that and how that relates to um, race and reconciliation, I I do want to remind you that um, the viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. So as I continue to make sure I've got all of my clips set up, um, I want to give you some insight. You know, we've talked a lot about concepts and what you need to be aware of as we talk more about um, reconciliation and, and how that relates to truth and healing. And no place is that more evident than viewing how a city, how a city a municipality spends their money um, in the, you know, in the process of reconciliation, and they may not talk about it as reconciliation, um, but it's, it's critical for that part about social justice and economic equity. And so what I've been observing since I've moved back to Austin um, since November of 2016, I'm kind of one of those political geeks. You know, I, I actually have been have extensive experience with government different government entities um also on the nonprofit side of the world and you you really can't figure out what is going on with the city if you don't know the process so we're going to talk about that um a little bit we're going to talk about this whole concept that we've mentioned before of ethnocentric and ethno relative because what that really gets into is power and the perception of power um, but I do want to give you the website for the city to actually see their budget as it um, is proposed to be rolled out and approved um, December 21st 2017 and the website for the city is savannahga.gov forward slash budget now, this show is not about judgment. I, I just want to make sure that's clear. I am not going to be pointing out, um, oh, you need to look at the city council meeting and see how this person talked to that person. Um, it's really encouraging you to look through the lens of reconciliation. If you look through the lens of reconciliation, it means you're not really judging. And that's a very hard thing to do because that's kind of how we are programmed as human beings. It's a lot easier to judge what you see without saying, well, wait a minute, what am I doing to contribute to this process? What am I doing that's adding to um, the disconnect in power? And um, what you really need to pay attention to is not only the city council meeting, but especially the work session <laughs> and the work session from December 12th, 2017 is the one I would really direct your attention to because it is like this, 
this um, reconciliation lab of how the dynamics work with this council. And if you're if you're not careful, you would look at it and go and look at the council and go, well, you know, it's about 50 50 you know, with representation between African Americans and whites and city council, and there's a Hispanic um, city manager. So it looks like things should be pretty even. However, the reality is it has nothing to do with African Americans even being a majority population in Savannah. It's all about the power and the perception of power. And one of the things I do want to point out, I've, I've kind of revamped the One Human Nation website. So you can actually go to now a resource page and you'll see show 32 and you'll see some of the things that um, we're talking about as well as the clips that we're going to be listening to. So I want to start with um, this first clip. The first clip we're going to listen to, like I said, is... is um, A millennial who was a guest on the show. She lives in Savannah. She went to um, through the public school system in Savannah. And she is just she's just an awesome person. So take a take a look at this clip from um, an interview with Sydney. Well, I do have some advice and I feel like anybody can flourish in an environment. They just have to have a different mindset. Good. So. One, you have to learn to love yourself, and this isn't something that happens overnight like most people know. And there's a bunch of books out there about anything, you know, how to be successful, how to love yourself, how to be beautiful. So this is a a young person that is very centered. She is very much um, aware, and she was was in an environment that um, that really embraced, you know, which track she was going to be on. And um, we're going to listen to another clip from her because what's interesting is how much she thinks that she had um, control over this college track that she's on. And actually, based on where we are um, in our timeline now, she's actually already in her first year of college. Oh. Did directly tell me to do the IB track, but... For some reason, I had some friends that were doing it, and I'm like, oh, that seems cool. So I just jumped in, and it happened to benefit me. Right. So just for the benefit of our listeners, what is the IB track? The IB track is International Baccalaureate, and it's basically all around the world. And you take a specific IB classes, so it's like up there with AP classes, and it's just a higher level class. It's a more vigorous curriculum. Okay. Okay, so that kind of got you in the position. So you were always on the track of knowing that you were going to be going to college. Is that correct? Yes, okay. Basically. Okay. So one of the things I would suggest for you to do, if you want to hear more of this interview with Sydney, because um, she talks about, you know, um, she, she that her mom really didn't really try to push her in one direction or or the other. At least that's that was her take on it. <laughs> I I can tell you that that was not the take on how it went at all. But her, I, I know her mom and her mom's phenomenal. So she did an excellent job between her, you know, her mom and her grandparents of really um, in, encouraging her in a way that it, she she didn't feel like she was being told what to do, but she was um, being guided in that direction. And so when we talk about um what's happening, what's happened to the youth in the city of Savannah, we're not talking about the youth that are on um, a track of success. And that doesn't mean you necessarily have to be on a track of going to college, but they, they get why they need um, technical training, they are motivated, and they have a certain mindset. And, And that's where we have the disconnect, we have to look at how can we change the mindset and marginalized um, youth. And one of the ways to look at that is, and, and why is that so important? And I've mentioned on the show before, is that there is um, an African warrior tribe, the Musai tribe, when those warriors greet each other, they greet each other asking the question, Kaserian Injeri, which is, and how are the children? 
And the warrior's response, and this doesn't matter if they have children or not, all the children are well. So until we get to the place in our society that we understand we are all responsible for the children, it does not have anything to do with whether we have children or not. It doesn't have anything to do that, oh, well, we were previously a teacher, but we're now retired and um There is a a large retirement population in in Savannah. It doesn't mean that you disconnect because we still have responsibility to all of the children. And so we're actually going to listen to a couple of clips from Dr. Joy DeGruy that really spent some time in researching and looking at the trauma that has been um, from generation to generation. And as you know, in Savannah, we have a direct link to um, enslaved people. Um, you know, my ancestors were enslaved in this area, but you know th- that doesn't mean they had a defeated spirit. So how do we how do we understand and really get a handle on the trauma of the youth that um, are disconnected? So we're going to take a lo- uh, listen to this um, clip from Dr. Joy talking about trauma. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. My family is originally from Los Angeles, New Orleans, Louisiana, Lafitte, Louisiana, and Belize. My, my grandfather is from Belize, so that's kind of my family background. Recently, I did the DNA swap and found out that my family uh, was from Sierra Leone. My interest has always been in human behavior, always. I mean, I've always been curious about it. Trauma showed up for me when I started you know, really looking at trauma and particularly violence. That was the area I looked at in my, in my doctoral work was African-American male youth violence. And what I was trying to determine is how can we predict this? What is the, the, the linkages, the causal factors involved with the use of violence? Uh, one of the things that obviously came up that you, know, you had to learn in order to be a clinician uh, was post-traumatic stress disorder. That was one of the things that I studied, right? And I thought, wow, this is interesting. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. In other words, the trauma can happen to you directly or the trauma can be indirect. Now, we are most familiar with veterans of war, uh, victims of natural disaster. We, we've learned about folks that carry this, this scar or this injury called post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, of course, I'm going to stop and I'm going to think, what does that have to do with black people? and contemporary use of violence. But if we were to look at the experience of being enslaved and we start looking at the potential traumas, direct and indirect, that were experienced, of course, reading slave narratives, we get a picture, 12 years a slave, you know, Amistad, we, we get a picture. And reading the slave narratives, you get the voices of the people talking about their experience. So as I unpack what that looks like, I'm looking at generational trauma. Not only am I looking at generational trauma, I'm looking at generational trauma untreated because no one helped you with your trauma. No one helped you when they sold your child or, you know, they raped your 10 year old or they lynched your son. No one helped you with that. There was no, you know, Dr. Phil coming in to work with you. So you did the best you could, right? But we're extraordinarily resilient. Clearly African-American people are extraordinarily resilient. You know, we had our own physicians, we had our own um, knowers and healers and people that helped the best they could. But then we got freed, right? So you have all that trauma, no help, then you got freed. Did you get any help then? That would be no, you got no help. But did the trauma continue? You bet it did, because following slavery was peonage, sundown laws, black codes, convict lease, which ultimately led into overrepresentation of the criminal justice system. Oh, redlining, gentrification, you know, straight line in terms of the trauma. But at what point did we heal? At what point was there an acknowledgement, one, that you've been injured, and two, that there's some need to heal that? Because if, in fact, I have post-traumatic stress disorder, which my theory of post-traumatic slave syndrome is not, but post-traumatic stress disorder is certainly connected. If people had post-traumatic stress disorder and it went untreated, then it becomes part of normal behavior. 
Now, what does post-traumatic stress disorder look like? Hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response, outburst of anger, difficulty falling or staying asleep, a feeling of foreshortened future. Those are the, some of the symptoms of post-traumatic. Well, if, if mama is exhibiting those behaviors, I don't know mama's broken. That's just mama. Oh, and my uncle and also my neighbor and everyone else. So then what we end up calling it is cultural. <laughs> we say, oh, that's, that's just how they are, right? And I would submit to you that's not just how they are. I've been to seven countries in Africa. It doesn't look like that, right? There are issues in Africa, but they don't look the same because it's not based on that historical level of injury. So what I started to realize is that, no, it's not post-traumatic stress disorder by, oh God, I wish it was. <laughs> because then we could put them in the room, we could get them the treatment and they could get well, maybe. But we're looking at multi-generational trauma over time, collectively with social learning, what you learn in your environment, adaptive behaviors, good and bad, right? Healthy behaviors you, you know, and other be behaviors you adapt to, to survive. And then at the end of the day, folks call it cultural. So I think there's poison in the cookies. You, can, you couple that with things that we do know. For example, we've looked at other groups. We've looked at Native Americans and multi-generational trauma. We've looked at Aboriginal folks in Australia. We've looked at Jewish Holocaust. Why have we not looked at the history of generations of slavery and ensl enslavement followed by extraordinary clan behavior and oppress oppressive policies and lynchings and it didn't stop it's not like slavery ended and the you know the, the playing field got level that didn't happen so what's interesting about um what dr joy i just like to refer to her as dr joy is referring to is something that i see demonstrated in savannah and um i think you, if you've listened to the show before you know how much i love being back in savannah i love savannah i love the whole um, vibe in savannah compared to where i was living in texas in austin specifically and it, there's a totally different vibe here and, and one of the reasons why is that um, externally on the scale of um, ethnocentric to ethno relative, meaning um, the interaction between the white um, culture and the African American culture, the people of color on the surface, it's very comfortable. There is, there is not um, uh, an, an obvious disconnect where people are afraid to talk to each other or they don't communicate with each other or there's, um, you know, there is, uh, I haven't had the experience yet in Savannah, which I had all the time in Austin, that if I went to a restaurant, I um, immediately knew b b because of the looks I was getting that they were like, oh, a black person, you know, what is she doing here? And it's like, I'm here to eat a meal. And, um, and then the dynamics, the the vibe would change depending on if someone else was meeting me there and they were also um, African-American, you can kind of feel the tension increase. But if the person that I was meeting with was actually white, they're like, oh, OK, well, I guess she's OK. So what you need to know about the dynamics in Savannah and what I look at is when I left Savannah in 1981, some of the same problems that Savannah is dealing with now were the same issues then. And I don't know if you're familiar with how the economy was in Savannah in 1981. I mean, that was one reason I moved away was because it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to be able to get a job here. And I, I just, you know, I was ready to, to leave. Um, but some of these same neighborhoods are dealing with the same problem. So now you're talking about generational um, problems that have not been corrected, but you're dealing with youth that are a lot more savvy. You know, so if I gave a three or four year old um, my um, phone, they can figure out things on that phone that I, I don't even know that my phone that, that my phone could even do. Right. <laughs> so they're they're not um, they're not slow to figure things out. And what they're also figuring out at a very early age is, well, what does this look like for me? You know, because what you're telling me and what you're trying to teach me doesn't match the environment that I'm in at home. I'm in an environment at home that anytime there's just a little bit of rain, my neighborhood floods. 
I'm in an environment at home where all around me I see um, boarded up buildings and neighborhood blight. Now, to give the city of Savannah credit, it has, um, you know, laid out in its consolidated plan. If you take a look at their website, you'll see they've they've laid out, you know, what the city council has uh, adopted as a blueprint blueprint for community revital revitalization. Um, it looks at target neighborhoods and what's being developed there to address livability issues like land use and housing and economic development and youth development and infrastructure and leadership and capacity building and all of this stuff that on paper sounds really good. But where is the money being spent? Is it being spent in those neighborhoods? So if you look at the process that the city is going through right now to approve their budget, um, there is only a, you know, I, I haven't looked at the percentage yet and I want to reserve judgment until I see the final budget that's going to be um, approved. But realize that the city has to fund either from the general fund, um, their federal dollars um, or bonds. And the other part of where they're going to be looking for funding, if you haven't been paying attention, is a fire fee that's going to be implemented. So how is this all playing into how are programs um, going to be funded in 2018 that address the question and how are the children, all the children are well? Because we obviously have some children in our community at a very young age that are not well. We have, you know, the three, four, five, six years old that are living in poverty situations. And then you have the um, youth pregnancies of, you know, um, 14 years old that are having babies. And how, how is that change from generation to generation? And, you know, when I look at the history of my ancestors, yes, they did have babies at a early age also, but for different reasons. It was a different time in a different environment. So one of the things that um, I'm really paying attention to as I learn more about Savannah, and this, this is what this is all about, you know, um, really taking a look and analyzing where we are in creating um, a truthful dialogue about reconciliation and really taking a look at our unconscious biases. And when you take a look at the work session from December 12th, you will have a really bird's eye view of the distribution of power and the perception of power and how things are relayed and how things are implemented. And because I've been listening to um, city council for some time now, and especially their work sessions, I have heard some council members say, well, you know, I'm, we're not committed to what previous councils did. You know, we, we can, we, we don't have to fund those things based on what was done previously. Well, how is that helping to address a systemic problem from generation to generation? So let me set up this next clip to listen to from Dr. Joy, where she gets into more of the um, the conversation about um, violence is a is an attempt to replace shame with self esteem, and this is from a book she references from Dr. James Gilligan that's entitled Violence. So it, it's it's about learned behavior and. Um, what we can do to change that requires funding. It requires programs. It requires diligence from administration to administration. It should not matter the dynamics on the city council if they truly understand how are we going to move through um, truth and healing. So let's take a listen. Is there a fundamental driver to American street violence? I think so. I think the driver is anger. We have to talk about why there's so much anger. And that anger, I think, is not a simple thing. I think it's, I think it's complex. And I think it's uh, long-suffering. And I think it's all the, also the outcome of things that have broken down, right, on a lot of different levels. I think that 
you know, first and foremost, when, when a person is, is there, it's, a, it's an act of frustration, for example, or what I call in my book, Block Goals, um, some of the work of uh, um, Dr. Samuels. This whole idea, if you take a baby and you constantly block the baby, right, you see, each time it reaches for something, you move it or you block it, it'll get frustrated and angry. And if that's consistent enough, it's, the result's going to be this outburst, and it's going to be anger, and it's going to be potentially violent. And that violence can happen on a lot of different levels. You can implode, violence is internalized, or it can explode, violence is externalized. If every time I go to the door, someone hits me, right? Uh, and let's say that uh, everyone I know that whenever they go to this door, someone hits them. Eventually folks stop going to the, to the door, right? It's called learned helplessness. Right? And if then there's something called vicarious learned helplessness, right? Which means that if you're my hero, if you're my dad, you're the person I look up to, and you can't go to the door, then I'm not going to even try to go to the door. That's called vicarious learned helplessness, right? So after a while, I, the door is open. <laughs> Wait, first of all, the door isn't even, not only is there no one there and no one's going to hit you, the door is open and folks won't go to the door. The good news is you can have learned efficacy. Right? The same thing can happen the other way. Well, if you can do it, I can do it, right? If I can see that, if I can experience that process, then I can break that behavior. But if that is what I see for the most part in my environment, that is what um, I have experienced and others like me, then I get to the point where I don't try anymore. But I'm, I'm still a human being. I still have all the wants, desires, goals, dreams. So I would talk to the young men, and when I was trying to put together my pilot, Right? I would sit around, talk to the kids in basketball. Yeah, I would talk to some kids who were incarcerated. I'd talk to all these different kids about violence and about the, you know, the, the crime in the community and that kind of thing. And, and they would give me their reasons. I said, why do you think? And they go, I mean, people who diss people. I said, diss? They said, yeah, well, you dissed them. You know, you, you know, people feel dissed. You diss somebody, meaning disrespect. So I said, well, I need to really unpack this respect thing. Hypothesis. The more respected an African-American male youth felt, the less likely they'd be violent. The more disrespected they felt, the more likely they'd be violent, right? I asked them two open-ended questions. And this was going to really give me a sense of how they connect things. And the two questions were about respect. If you or your friends ever felt disrespected, why do you think it happened? And why do you think someone like you might be disrespected? So I let them all answer. 100 incarcerated, 100 that weren't in the rites of passage programs, culture specific. Got all of the results back, got all of their answers. The majority of their answers was because of black, being black. It's because of history. It's because of slavery. These were the words they came back with, with me. It's because we're black in a white man's America because they will never give us a chance because they hate us, because they're afraid we're powerful, because they, all of these things came back, very powerful statements by all 200 of these young black males. And so the question becomes, how long will you be black? <laughs> well, you will always be black. So how long, whether it's real or perceived, do you feel like you will be disrespected? So then I wanted to know what was the most significant predictor of African-American male youth violence of all of the variables. And once you, you, the two fall out, the baselines, which is victimization, and, and, and we already know that, and, um, you know, witnessing, was respect. And respect is linked to history. The marginalization and the perpetual marginalization of black males. So when you start looking at criminal justice and how it treats these violent offenders, what, it's, what it actually does, and this is an incredible book called Violence, um, by Gilligan, um, this, the idea of how do you stop the violence, what they normally do is figure, I'm going to break you. I'm going to break you down. So it's, it's, it's counterintuitive if you're dealing with black males because the more you disrespect them, what's going to happen? The more violent they'll become. So the systems of correction are actually creating a greater problem. Are you following me? That's the problem, is that you're saying, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to break you. Not black males. And I would, I would suspect not Latino males either. Because when you do that, you're going to increase the violence. Because they're associating that violence with something far greater than just this moment. They're looking at a historical 
uh, intent to hurt them, which I'm sorry, you may say they're paranoid, but someone's following them because the data shows that that is in fact what has happened up to 2015. If you've just joined us, you're listening to the One Human Nation show on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. As a reminder, the viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. Here's an announcement coming up for um, December 16th in reference to Savannah artists are raising money for Puerto Rico with an art sale on Saturday, December 16th, 2017, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. This art sale is sponsored by Asbury Memorial United Methodist Church at 1008 East Henry Street, Savannah. Everything raised in this sale will go to UMCOR with all proceeds for Puerto Rico relief. As we continue to learn more about um, how this whole concept of reconciliation fits into the dynamics that um, that's happening within the um, city as far as how do we go through the process of allocating funds. Um, I definitely invite you to tune in when the city, um, even before the budget process that's going to be presented, the final budget is supposed to be presented December 21st, 2017. So I would highly recommend that you listen to the um the work sessions that um, from December 12th. And I will tell you, if you don't put on your reconciliation hat, if you really don't take some deep breaths before you, um, before you engage in watching these, it can be very, um, <laughs> it, it can be very frustrating. So you, you've got to have some tools to, to work with. And, and one of the tools is really understanding the whole process of ethnocentric, versus ethno relative. So what I've done on the One Human Nation um, website, which is at onehumannation.info, I've actually uploaded some reference materials like the ethnocentric versus ethno relative um, chart. And it basically shows what needs to happen in order for us to move towards justice. So when you're in a very ethnocentric world, which we are as part of the process of, of everything in this country, it is it was designed by white people. And one of the things, you know, that I learned at a very young age is you need to know the process. You need to know how things work. And there were some times when, you know, um, I, I learned this message in, in, in even playing um, games with my with my my siblings, my older siblings, because I was the youngest. And my immediate response would be, well, they're cheating or um, I, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's not fair. And I can remember my mom saying to me, you need to know how the game is played. Now, she took it one step far, far further and actually would sit down and kind of teach me some strategy so that that helped. But that's one of the things you will notice as you start looking at the process that this year for the budget, the city has introduced a new process that has thrown um, some of the um, organizations into a tailspin. And in a way, it's good because I am a big believer in that you don't get funding just because you got funding before. You really need to make the case of what you're doing to continue to tweak your programs, to um, provide the service as efficiently as possible, and, and not just, you know, try to pull on emotions of why this should be funded. So the city staff um, has a very ethnocentric point of view, I mean, because that's how they operate. So what you'll see as you watch the work session, they'll talk about the process and they talk about it several times. Well, part of the process, you know, for this new process, we had a couple of workshops and invited all of the nonprofits to um 
to ask questions and learn more about the application process. And we um, explained the um, application process. And I mean, they, they make it very clear. Yes, they did have a process. But when you're implementing a, a new process, it sometimes takes more than one year for everybody to get it. So I'm, I'm sure they're going to figure out a way to fund some of these um, initiatives that didn't get funded just because it's, um, if nothing else, it's new, but it also, you know, speaks to why communication is so um, important. And it, it's more than just saying, well, we have a process. It's, it's more about saying, well, we need to really see if anybody was um, excluded from this process. So what it requires is, yeah, I'll just tell you, it requires for white people to give up the power, whether it's real power or the perception of power. That's the dynamics that I see on the city council. Uh, I, I see where... Um, there's a disconnect on power. And some of the council members that are African American, I think they realize that, you know what, no one's really listening to me. And some of them are tenacious. I'm going to I'm gonna give them credit. They hang in there. They're like, you know, I'm not going to lose my train of thought on this. I'm going to make sure I stay focused on this particular program that I'm interested in. Um, and, um, especially as it comes to the fire fee and the implementation of that, there was another um, dialogue about um, one of the council members said, well, you know, we never did look at other options. You know, it was decided by council that we would go with the fire fee. And that started this whole other um, dialogue that really speaks to the power and the perception of power because there wasn't anything else that was was taken into consideration. In order for that to be taken in consideration, then council has to give direction to the city manager. And um, there was kind of this unanimous opinion that, well, we're just going to go with the fire fee. Whether that's Right or wrong, that's kind of the way this is all shelled out. So if you haven't if you haven't been paying attention and you think, well, we can stop the implementation of the fire fee, um, I can only say to you, good luck with that, because that that has already happened. So as we um, continue talking about this dynamics of um, trauma, as we talk about the dynamics of of, of why there is a disconnect and how this looks to um, African-American males in the city of Savannah, it, it doesn't take much to see that they don't feel respected, that they, they're disconnecting from the process at a very young age. So we're going to listen to um, this third clip from, from Dr. Joy that talks about um, the role of reconciliation. Absolutely true that reconciliation is appropriate, it's useful, and it's effective. But there's some, some, other, um, some other variables that have to be in place for that to work. So, for example, um, some years ago, I was asked to speak at a Martin Luther King. Now, when I got there, I didn't know it was three to six-year-olds. <laughs> okay, so when I showed up, it was three to six-year-olds. So I'm trying to figure out in a short period of time, how can I somehow explain you know, because I wasn't prepared. None of my notes were for children three to six. Let me just say that. I had no idea that's who I was going to be talking to. So I decided, I said, let's do a play. And of course, everybody's very excited. And they're waving their hands. I want to be in a play. So I get two kids to come out of the audience, two little girls. I said, here's going to be our, our play. I'm going to be the teacher. You're going to be the students. They're going to sit at desks. I give one a toy. I give one a crayon. And it's a piece of paper. So I'm at my desk. The little girl that has crayon gets up and leaves. The girl that has a toy takes a crayon. So when she comes back, she sees a little girl has her crayon. So she goes and says, teacher, teacher, she took my crayon. So I get up and I ask the little girl, I said, did you take a crayon? Yes. Say you're sorry. So the little girl goes, I'm sorry. So she goes and she sits back down. The other little girl goes back and sits down. And all the little kids in the audience are like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And I'm going, wait a minute. Let's do it again. So I get up. She has a crayon. I said, did you take a crayon? She goes, yes. I said, then say you're sorry. She says, I'm sorry. I said, well, then that's okay, right? And the little kid's going, no, 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 no. I said, well, what is it? They go, well, she's got to give back the crayon. It's not enough to just say you're sorry. So <laughs> in, in truth and reconciliation, are we really reconciling? In other words, if I am getting ready to 
to find a way for us, those who have done harm and those who have been harmed, to come together. One of the key factors here is you can't keep harming me. Right? So, so in, a, in a situation like the United States, um, it's not enough to just say, I'm sorry, and to bring those parties together. We have to ensure that this will not continue to happen. You know, you can't continue to, to break my leg, and even though you give me doctors and good medicine, if you keep breaking my leg, it can't heal. So this requires social justice. It's not one of those things where, you know, uh, can we all get along? This, has to, this requires social justice, unlike a clinical thing where you said this requires that you change the policies and the behavior and the structural, structural inequities that perpetuate the injury in the first place. So yeah, I'm, I think people are very willing and very open and very capable of doing that. But that can only happen in an environment where we can ensure that those injustices will cease. So we're listening to a couple of clips from Dr. Joy DeGruy, and um, those are posted at the One Human Nation website. That's onehumannation.info. If you go to show 32, you'll be able to click on the link and see the YouTube video, actually. So it's always interesting when you watch the video because you can see the person's expression. And I realize if you're driving, that's not something that you can do at this particular point in time. But I do encourage you to really get... um, get a little bit deeper into this journey about reconciliation and um, have a, a clearer understanding of what it means for truth and healing in Savannah because you can't continue to um, neglect certain areas of the city because it just perpetuates the problem. And one of the things that, you know, it, it appears on the surface, it looks really good. So this, this brings us back to the concept of the iceberg culture. So everything above the waterline when you look at an iceberg is external culture. So there's some things externally that are happening um, that seem to be very proactive for reconciliation. You know, the resolution to rename the Talmadge Bridge, um, the interest in adding the um, alternative story for the, um, you know, besides the Confederate monuments, what are some of the other things that happen to tell the story of the enslaved people and the indigenous people? So those are all good things. I'm not saying we don't need to do that. This is a very complex issue. It is not just a one solution but it does require the political will of our leadership to be warriors and to ask at the end of the day, are all the children well? We're going to take a short break and be back with One Human Nation. If you enjoy our programming on WRUU-LP, please support the station with a donation. As an individual, you can give any amount, become a basic station member, or become a serious fan of the station. To check out membership rates and to donate to the station, go to www.wruu.org forward slash individual and select to donate monthly or subscribe to an annual membership. Again, to donate go to the station at www.wruu.org slash individual and select to donate monthly or subscribe to an annual membership. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUU-LP. So as we continue our conversation today, and I've got my eye on the time, and there's a there's one more clip that I, I want us to listen to, and it was from a previous guest that was on the show, and it speaks to how things have changed in growing up in our neighborhoods. Um, and this is a person that didn't grow up in Savannah, but I also um, listened to one of the shows on WRUU that um, interviewed um, Dr. Otis Johnson, and he actually has a book out, and he talks about a lot of this, and, you know, growing up in Savannah. So, um, you know, that's there's information out there, but there's kind of a, a trend during a certain time period of the interaction between the children in a neighborhood and the adults in the neighborhood. So let's, let's take a listen to that. 
and I was loving life um, because, again, it was a close-knit community. It was back in the day when, you know, my neighbor's mother or neighbor's father um, could speak to me and give me direction, could right. discipline me and say, no, you need to go sit down or you need to go do this. Right. And, you know, you listened. So when one parent came outside as the whole neighborhood of children were playing and gave us an instruction, right. we all listened. Exactly. So that uh, was insight from um, one of the guests on the show, Sheila. And that's, if you want to listen to the entire interview, that's show 19 that aired earlier this year. And it, it speaks to how the dynamics in a community have changed. And there's a generational disconnect. This is the other thing that you will observe once you watch the engagement from um, city council, especially in the workshop um, the work session that I'm referring you to from December 12. And there's a there's a council member that is just having such a difficult time getting his head around the concept of why um, there was a proposal on the table of, you know, opening um, a couple of community centers and um, neighborhoods where kids need to be engaged. These marginalized kids need to be engaged. But the time that these um, centers need to be open is from like eight in the evening to 12 at night. And you can see he's just like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> if if they're supposed to be um, getting ready for school the next day, when are they going to get their homework done? So they actually had to take some time and it, it's describe how the program worked because this was a person that was still living in the age of thinking that everyone, all the children have access to the same type of support at home, that there is someone there making sure that the homework was done, that they had a meal, that they were in bed by a certain time, that they, you know, um, it, it wasn't where in the community I grew up in, uh, it wasn't acceptable for me to be out of the house still late in the evening um, after eight o'clock, you know, when it got dark, you pretty much better be home, you know, you better not hear your mom calling um, and, and um, <laughs> calling your name because that that was not going to end very well for you once you did once you did um, to get home. But times have changed. Times have changed because there is a different way that um, based on generational neglect, we haven't done enough to address the marginalized um, youth in our city. And um, we're going to listen to a clip from another guest that was on the show. And it, it has one component that I think is really critical to um, balancing things out, but it's it, it gets even more complex than, than what he states, but it, it is also an option that needs to be on the table. Um, I, I really, I really uh, think that the uh, the literacy issue is 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 a is a primary uh, a primary concern. There is a coalition uh, that has come together that uh, um, it goes under the moniker of Get Georgia Reading Campaign, mm -hmm. and uh, it has its it's its own organization, but it um, it has brought together a whole series of of, of people. To address this issue, and it's it's about getting all children in Georgia to be on a path to reading proficiency by the end of the third grade. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. And 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 um, I I can't hold this up enough. It's 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 had some amazing amazing results, and uh, I I hope to God that uh, that Chatham County will be right at the center and uh, of, of and, and a leader in Im implementation of this program. So that was, um, you know, from a previous guest on the show talking about literacy and the importance of literacy. And and I was a reader and uh, the guest that we heard the clip from earlier, Sydney, was talking about how much she enjoyed reading um, because it opens up another world for her. Um, it gets you out of the boundaries, what's going on in your neighborhood. 
The problem is if what you're reading is so far removed from your reality, and this is from generation to generation to generation, um, we really have to fix the um, infrastructure in these communities. We have to spend the money, um, and some of that is also capacity building. And, and when I say capacity building, um, I'm all in favor of the world uh, of the the premise of you know you teach a person um, how to fish as opposed to just giving them a fish, um, and what it appears to be the other problem that we're dealing with. And, and when I heard this, and I can't remember if it was in this work session, uh, December 12th, um, or some other um, council session, but I heard it and I, I don't think I was mistaken. The city manager said it and no one else expounded on it. But it appears that we have independent nonprofits that are on the city's payroll and receiving benefits and access to pension. Now, I don't know which groups these are. I don't know how long this has been going on, um, but that's not helping the problem. It is not helping us get to the point where we have self-sufficiency um, with organizational capacity in these communities. So uh, I encourage you to go to the city's website to take a look at the budget that's being proposed, and that's at www.savannahga.gov forward slash budget. Um, I encourage you to listen to the work session from December 12th. I encourage you to go to the One Human Nation website, onehumannation.info, and listen to these um, these these videos again from Dr. Joy DeGru, and also really take a look at this whole concept of um, ethnocentric and ethno relative. Because the reality is, when you are the dominant culture, you don't really see that you have an advantage because of the power you have or the perception of the power you have. And that's a very delicate line. That's a very complex issue because when I observe the um, interaction with city council, I don't pick up on any obvious, um, you know, dislike of an individual. Uh, that that's not what's going on. But what is going on is the lack of understanding that in order for us to move towards justice, we have to create an environment. This is whether it's city council meetings, um, their work sessions, the planning process, uh, including the community on every every level, um, even with what's going on in your your churches, we have to create an environment that allows people to interact with equal power for equal distribution of power. And that's where it gets to be a slippery slope. And so for whites, this means you have to be willing to give up the power. So all members of the group will feel included. And for people of color, it means we have to engage in the process. We have to learn the system. We have to be knowledgeable about the system. And we have to work with the systems that we have in place. So we're coming to the end of today's show. And I want to leave you with... Um, I do want to leave you with a thought for the next week's show, but um, as a friendly reminder, the viewpoints expressed in the preceding program were not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. And as you move through this week and think about um, what, what I'm going to be talking to you on the next show, I want you to think about this question. And it's a two-part question. One part of it is, would you trade your skin color? The other part of the question is, how do you think your life would be different if you looked like someone from a different group and actually write down a specific way? Because the next show, we're going to get into this and more specific about a concept called colorism. But right now, it is time for us to connect with Troy Stoner coming up with Sound Limit. Thank you for listening to the One Human Nation show.